Good afternoon, Dumelan, Nikai, and thank you for joining us again for the TK show, the second one for the year. And uh, I think today's one is going to be quite special, quite relevant, uh, especially in the context of uh, a lot of what we're seeing in the country where people are starting to ask, am I living in the right municipality? And if not, where should I go to? So today we have Dr. Nzo who will point you towards where is the best municipality you can live in in South Africa? Uh, I won't go too much into her introduction. Suffice to say, I think she's one of the few people who really kind of explains local government quite well in an understandable way. Because as uh, Dr. Nzo, you'll probably find that you get two understandings of local government. There's one which is purely political and, and where people come in and say, oh, we've got local government elections. Or there's a technocratic way, which kind of excludes a lot of people in. Yeah, we speak about IDPs, budgetary processes, and people feel, oh, okay, where do I actually fit into this? And I think you kind of find a lovely middle ground. And we're just hoping maybe just to expand on that today. So Dr. Nzo, welcome to the TK Show. Thank you very much, TK. And let me also greet your audience. It's quite a privilege um, to actually have a first podcast, which is hosted by you. I've never done a podcast before, so this is a first experience for me. But I'm looking forward to the conversation. No, great stuff. And look, I, I, I like podcasts for this specific reason that when it comes to topics such as this, people can actually expand. As you would know on television, you know, that five minute clip is, <laughs> it's good, but it doesn't quite really do justice to many of the things which you're doing. But I think a good place to start is how do you find yourself working in this space, having been at, in the UK? What happened? Did Brexit affect you? <laughs> did you have to come? Did they Brexit you out? Just tell us about that because you've got a very interesting profile. <laughs> well, actually, I was in the UK on the prime of Brexit when it was actually happening all, all, all at once, including the Scottish referendum as well. Well, being in the local government space, where do I begin? Um, it started at my early years, prime years, when I left university after completing my honours from the University of Natal in Peter Maritzburg campus where I studied uh, policy and development. And I had an interest in local government. And fortunately, I was funded back then by an organization called Public Policy Partnership um, that provided us with the scholarship of doing our honors and our masters. So I, I informed them that I would actually like to take a break and get um, a one-year internship experience before continuing for the master's program. So um, at the age of 21, I graduated. I applied at the former Institute for Local Democracy in South Africa. That institute no longer exists, but back in the days it was called IDASA. And they had a local government program and I made an application and voila, they accepted me and I did my one year stint. I got very hooked from that, from that phase onwards and I've never left local government. I've pursued my studies in between um, while doing work. I stayed on at Idasa for um, five full years. I managed to do my master's, but I was not satisfied with the master's that I had pursued on, on governance and public management because I specifically wanted to focus on local government studies. And sadly, that's the reality that we have in the country where we don't have a curriculum that is specific specifically designed for local government as a discipline and as, you know, as a qualification. Hence, I decided to leave and go for, I mean, pursue for a, a master's in, in local government studies at the University of Birmingham, of which I absolutely did not regret it because after that, it was just all systems go for me. So yeah, um, yeah, 16 years in the field of local government and I truly appreciate the work that I have I have done, learned in the process and also participating, you know, in, you know, shaping the policy position of local government in the country. No, that's interesting. So from PMB, I went to Howard College. <laughs> so yeah, we always used to think of PMB as our sister campus, the little sister, yeah. but the quiet, bizarre one. Yeah. So yeah. from Peter Maritzburg to Birmingham, just if you can maybe just explain some of the dynamics you saw from a local government perspective, which uh, did they have an influence on you or yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, you're stepping, you're stepping into a different, 
you know, environment, a different country with a different political system. Um, well, although we can consider ourselves as an Anglophone country where some of our, our state structures and systems have been influenced by the British system and also taking into account that we also have another history of the Dutch, you know, later we had an apartheid um, regime coming into the fold. But yeah, largely, primarily speaking, we have been influenced um, by the British system. So when I, when I pursued my studies, I had to concentrate on the British local government system, but within the context of the EU region as well, because Britain was under the EU <laughs> during that time. So I learned a lot, uh, TK. Um, one fascinating aspect when you are going into an advanced modern democracy is to see their understanding of what local representative democracy is, what participatory governance is all about, um, being exposed to the concept of hung councils, because during that time we hadn't had um, a lot of prefora of hung councils as we find today. Um, and to also understanding minority governments, coalitions, um, independent candidates, independent parties, um, you know, directly elected mayors. And what was also quite surprising, you know, was for me to, to learn that they also had similar challenges that we were facing with when it comes to political and administrative interface. And we had a specific module, or should I say a course that was dedicated, you know, to politics and administration because of the tensions that arose um, during those times and even still now um, within the European region and understanding how they've actually come to address those issues and understanding how it's so um, idealistic to separate the both, but, you know, with the different systems of, of of the levels of capacity and professionalism, that's where I found it to be quite interesting because that's where we lack in the country. So I was I was really exposed to that and also studying, um, you know, getting practical insight through the different assignments that we did where we went to different county councils. Um, we had interviews with mayors, the administration, um, you know, and also looking at the different bodies that were, that were established um, for local government um, in the sense of, decentralizing, you know, um, governance and participatory governance where they have neighborhood governance, where they have, you know, um, the NHS system having to be also um, administered at local government level. So it was quite fascinating in that sense that um, it was quite an eye opener for me and gave me the kind of theoretical understanding of, under, you know, getting to grasp with this notion of what is local government and governance and participatory, you know, governance altogether. So yeah, it was absolutely incredible for me. But the only difference was that, um, I needed to contextualize it because sometimes we tend to fall into the trap of wanting, you know, to emulate Western countries of which we don't get to understand that the context is a bit different from an African perspective. So hence I pursued a PhD in African studies so that I would be able to understand exactly how do we view, you know, local governance within an African context taking into account that we've got different political regimes that operate at a different level. So yeah, that's why I ended up diversifying into African studies, but still focusing on local government. No, no, I find that absolutely quite interesting, especially I think three things which really do stick out. One, you speak about the idea of decentralization, you know, and in the South African context, I guess, it was chapter seven or how we kind of got into it was more of an issue. We thought about it from a more democratic perspective. And it just so happened that we said, look, these three spheres of government work. So maybe if you could just, it's interesting. And also I think the comparison you make with the UK, where you said that it's about the, the democratization aspect of it. And uh, yeah, I just maybe uh, I'll get to the, the North versus the South uh, debate in the UK, because I think it's also quite relevant in South Africa. But the key issue you picked up about, about high municipalities, maybe just an expansion on that, just from how you experience it in the UK to how we're seeing it in South Africa, any key differences or is politics really politics regardless of where you go in the world? <laughs> well, it, you know, in, in the UK system, that's where you actually get to see and experience democracy when you actually live in the UK. 
Um, I mean, for example, I wasn't expecting, you know, to find in a mature democracy where issues related to political parties were actually frowned upon by citizens. Um, the UK suffered from a, a you know, high level of, um, of apathy from their citizens um, and also the disconnection with political parties and a democratic, which actually, you know, underlined democratic deficit within their country. Um, their first um, election that I actually had to observe when I was still studying there, which was around 2010, um, the local government election, the, the, the voter outcome for the local government elections was actually sitting at 30%, 30%, 36% below the 40% margin. And there were questions, you know, that arose about to what extent, you know, does a 30% of the voter population represent, you know, the population of the UK, even, even the legitimacy of those who have been elected, you know, to become leaders in these, um, in these councils. And also the issue of hung councils, that was one of the major issues because, um, you know, citizens had rejected political parties. In fact, during that period, um, due to the uh, democratic deficit that they were facing, even the mayoral representation was also highly questioned as well. That's why um, around 2010, 2011, I mean, if you can also go back um, and look at the kind of publications that were coming out from, from um from the UK that focus particularly on local democracy representation and mayoral um, um, elections was that they were exploring alternatives such as directly elected mayors because they were they were desperate to look for ways in which they could actually allow you know this the British citizen to actually have a say in the election of their of their representatives so that's why you find that in the UK they have this very diverse um, system where in major cities you, you have directly elected mayors like the city of London and the borough of London, you go up um, to Wales, you also find that because they were just trying to test out the notion of whether if they can start removing politics from local government and looking at representation from a facet of citizens giving, you know, the electoral mandate to an individual or individuals they thought that they would better represent them in their constituencies would most probably enhance their democracy. So that's 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 an interesting point that I I actually got to, you know, got to see and experience and learn from it. And during that time, I never thought that South Africa would be in that kind of position because right now we are debating the same issues when it comes to our hung councils and the democratic deficit that we are facing. You know, I was quite surprised, TK, today to even see that we have parties which have which have declared that they will be contesting for the provincial and national government elections, where they're actually talking about, you know, the sentiments of, of removing themselves from politics and representing themselves as social movements, but registered mm -hmm. as political parties, which, you know, really talks to one of the dynamics that I learned during that time in the UK. And we are yet to find out if whether really do, does this enhance our democracy, the quality of our democracy. I don't know, because in the UK till today, you'll still find that their voter outcomes remain poor. It's still below the 40% and, and communities are just disenchanted with political parties because of the high politicization of their local councils. I think that's a, a particularly fascinating insight, the issue of that what the fit does a percentage at like 36% or less than 40 does this really speak to the fact of representation? And I think the way you've projected it on, I mean, one only has to look at the situation of the city of Joburg. Look, I feel sorry for the guy. I think it's the mayor, Ahmed, and his fantasy loans. Uh, but just, I think the point which you're touching on that eventually people get tired of it and just basically check out from politics. Now, obviously in the context of South Africa, look, I think the UK being the UK, I think they were quite wealthy at the time. What does that say then? I mean, how, just using your experiences in the UK and how you still look at the UK, if you had to almost project it into the South African context, where could this go where the numbers become lower and people, especially local government, because for us, local government is where things tend to happen. A lot of the major things tend to happen. Just uh, how bad or just maybe just speak us through worst case scenarios almost of people just becoming tired of this hang 
hung, in, hung municipalities and also the issues of coalitions? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, in the UK, I think they've had actually had to, to embrace that um, coalition politics will be part of their political landscape. Um, like I said that, um, you know, since my time in 2010, up till now, we are looking at 2023, which is um, 13 years later, the situation has not changed, of which for them, that experience of shifting into coalition politics started a long time ago. I mean, if you would read the Maud report um, on local government, um, you can actually look it up, which actually anticipated a serious shift and the democratic decline that they were ex you know, experiencing since the late 1980s to the early 1990s. They had predicted that, you know what, this is going to be from an a phenomena that they would have to live with. But one, one aspect that they really tried to do was to make local government as local as possible. There's also a report um, which talks about localism that was brought through David Cameron's um, um, government during that era, where they tried, you know, to reinvigorate the idea of having local government being at a level where neighborhoods and communities uh, are given, you know, um, the, the, the leverage of actually determining a self-determination of what they would like to see happening in their neighborhoods, working directly with their councillors. So it gives that sense of community agency back to communities, rather than actually keeping it at a political level where political parties could actually determine the kind of policy trajectory and development that ought to happen. And also taking into account that um, during that era, you know, uh, the UK was fa faced with an economic crisis because they were still coming out of, you know, that economic uh, meltdown, um, especially after 2011 or so. They, they, they felt the pressure. They felt the pressure. People lost jobs. Um, people, there was a high number of people who were jobless, who were registering in their local councils, trying to look for work. There was a budget deficit. So it was an era of saying we are trying to do more with, with less when it comes to our resources. So there was there was a movement of resilience that was beginning to emerge. And, you know, if I have to draw parallels, because I've been interacting a lot um, with our with our uh, state actors, you know, such as the Minister of Cooperative Governance, Salga as well. And you're starting to, to hear this idea of actually saying that we are throwing it back to our communities to start, you know, engaging and being more proactive in their own local governance, taking responsibility for their infrastructure, organizing themselves. Um, these were the utterances that were coming out from, um, from, the, from the newly appointed um, Minister of Cooperative Governance, um, um, Dao. Um, Park style. So you, 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 you can see that when there is a moment of a crisis and when polit politicians feel that they are slowly starting to become obsolete um, in the nature in which communities are beginning, you know, to reject them due to apathy, then they have to now re-strategize and try to find another identity of going back into communities. And for me, that was that was very striking. It really brought back a memory um, of 2010 of what I saw in the UK. So yes, localism became, you know, the policy idea, network governance became the policy idea of, of, of the day, um, you know, uh, commissioning of services um, to, the, to the NGO sector, um, the private sector to come in and actually try to bring in resources and their capacity and expertise to help local government you know, um, deliver their services and their mandates became the order of the day. Even with us, we have this notion of social compacting that is also starting to emerge from our government. So you, you, you see that once the, the, the situation becomes, you know, desperate for politicians, then they start rethinking about their positions and the way in which they can re, you know, reshape their identity to fit into communities. So that was one um, big lesson that I, I learned from that time. And and most probably in South Africa, that's the kind of trajectory that we will have to be facing moving forward with social movement and civil society organizations beginning to re-emerge to become more active in the local government space. No, I think that's quite, a, that's quite an insight, the issue that uh, politicians uh, almost uh, mutate into what the, the given situation is. But then, you know, uh, the, the reverse of that would be what happens in the context of a developing country where 
I mean, I, I dare say Birmingham, you know, London and those places are far advanced. But where, how do I put this? How does then development occur? Because the development, I mean, historically, it kind of works best when there's a centralization of power and there's a vision to it. How then do you find the issues like local economic development that are going to play out when the private sector doesn't know who to go to if we're going into a high municipality? And obviously, you know, the productivities of, Anna, what's the wording? Let's say the, the, the habits of our, of, our, of our political officials is not sometimes above board. And obviously, not to say the private sector is any different, but there is a question of development does almost need a vision and clarity. So how, you know, just almost projecting, because I think that's always the bigger debate that one is always seeing with these things of who do they go to and what's that going to look like? Mm -hmm. Well, um, just to, you know, to, to, to finish off with the kind of comparisons that I'm making through those experiences, um, the, the majority of, you know, of Hong councils in the UK is quite fascinating in the sense that firstly, they have learned to come to the understanding and live with the reality that they will have to form partnership with other, you know, political parties in order to form, you know, a council, a political um, leadership in a council. Now, what that meant was that they needed to look beyond party politics and agree on po policy positions that they shared common interest with. And that really has brought a sense of stability, even though um, competitive, competitively speaking, when it comes to the ballot box, they still struggle to get um, you know, a voter support, electoral support for their individual parties. So that kind of maturity is something that we are still grappling with, because when it comes to the foundation, of policy um, um, in terms of finding common identity and coercion amongst our political parties is still left behind. It's put at the backdrop. Here in Africa, we're dealing with a complexity of issues that also touch on the mere fact that um, we do not have an economy that is responsive you know, to the majority of our Black South Africans who can offer alternatives rather than looking into politics in advancing their career. And here we're talking about patronage politics. So in that sense, um, um, TK, yes, um, there is that difference. But you know, I was speaking to a, a a PhD candidate um, um, yesterday whom I was having an interview with who was actually asking me to give her perspectives about her, her thesis that she's developing, which is related to cooperative governance in enhancing a developmental state. And she wanted to really understand the three spheres of government that we have in terms of the role that they play in advancing a developmental state. And she wants to look at it from an economic perspective. And one of the things that I said to her was that, you know, it's 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 quite interesting that South Africa, you know, is placed at a pedestal when we when we look at South Africa's democratic formation that is embedded, you know, in a constitutional democracy or constitutional regime. Now, we, we are given, you know, accolades internationally to say that we have a very strong constitution that protects human rights, you know, that, that gives a highly devolved system of local government from national, provincial, you know, um, up, to, up to the local sphere. And also local government is given relative autonomy. And I say relative autonomy because constitutionally, local government is not autonomous if you look at section 139 and 152 of the constitution. So under that praxis, we find that our democratic state you know, from a political perspective, a human rights perspective, from a governance perspective enshrined in the constitution, we are very stable and it's the kind of democracy that um, most African countries would actually um, try to emulate, for example, um, I'm sorry, Kenya. Kenya uses both the South African system and also borrowed um, from the British and the American system. And they were very quite clear that the South African system really provided them with a, with a basis of understanding how they can reform their state. But now the question is, um, TK, with this democracy, are we seeing any kind of economic, you know, development that ought, you know, to contribute towards enhancing the quality and the livelihoods of our majority in this country? And sitting here having this conversation, we can actually say no. And the next mm -hmm. question would be, do the different spheres actually provide the kind of vision and leadership, you know, and agility 
to actually yeah. advance economic development and growth within their demarcated jurisdictions in provinces and municipalities? And the answer is no, we are struggling to do that with the foundations of democracy. Now I said to her, on the contrary, you know, if you want to compare um, our, our global South countries such as Brazil, China, India, Russia, you know, <laughs> they, they have a very limited form of democracy, particularly China, particularly Russia, you can call them pseudo democracies. Others may actually call Russia an, aut an autocratic state. China, um, sorry, Russia is an autocratic state. China is a one party state, you know, but those countries economically, they are progressing quite fundamentally so. And now this begs the question, you know, to say, does a centralized approach, you know, of running a country yield, um, you know, the kind of economic development that citizens are looking for? And lastly, just to make an example, I said to her that um, last year I visited um, Sochi. Um, in Sochi, they were hosting a program for BRICS youth to come in and actually, um, you know, look at the different kind of um, of advances um, when it comes to technology in order to curb financial outflows and financial crimes. And South Africa participated in that, and I was there for two weeks. Sochi is an incredible city. Um, it hosted, you know, the Olympics um, in Russia back in the days. And I was told when I was actually having informal discussions with the Russians about the way in which Sochi was developed, how it may, how it would continue to sustain itself and maintain itself post the Olympics. They said that Sochi became one of the most exclusive cities that were actually governed centrally by the president himself. The president was actually the one who was determining the allocation of resources, planning, et cetera. In fact, the mayor of Sochi was directly under the authority, the command and control authority of Putin himself. <laughs> it was so quite different. incredible. <laughs> he answered to Putin, um, you know, whatever developments they were happening that, you know, the president had to be in power with his committee. And up to the extent that even the economy of Sochi beyond the Olympics, you know, is still under the political authority in terms of oversight um, of central government. And it was quite incredible. And Sochi continues to, you know, to sustain itself, even, you know, the, the construction of the Olympics um, um, hall, the center where the Olympics were actually launched. That is actually regarded as one of the, the prime, um, you know, locations where the president and the statesmen actually have their own international engagements with other statesmen who are coming into the country. So it becomes, you know, a, a beacon, or should I say, mm. um, a monument, a monument of national government that national government wants to protect, even though it is located in a certain city. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's it's debates like these, um, TK, yeah. that you that you really have to look at. I mean, I can even give you the the example of Ethiopia, how the prime minister, sorry, um, yeah, the prime the, the the prime minister of Ethiopia, who's actually shown a greater interest in developing um, Addis Ababa to the extent that you actually see Ahmed, you know, appearing in almost every single program that needs to be launched, <laughs> you know, in Addis Ababa. Now that's the kind of, um, you know, centralized authority, um, a vision that is driven by a president that is earmarked, you know, at a certain location in order to protect their own economic interests. So these are the kinds of debates I said to her, you know what, you need to really think about this very carefully. Um, you need to interrogate this very carefully because it's not a very easy debate, especially in a country such as South Africa, where there are sentiments that are actually coming out in the public that we have a president, you know, who doesn't have a vision, <laughs> we have leaders who don't have visions, we've got mayors who don't have visions, actually don't even know how to use the IGR system and international relations, you know, towards their advantage. So, yeah, yeah, I'll just leave it at uh, that. I think that's particularly fascinating because, like you say, sometimes when these models come across, it's like either or, either pure decentralization or, or that. And I think what you've given is something in between. 
especially look in the context, I can maybe just flip it in the South African context where, look, we have over 200 municipalities and obviously there's a districts and everything else. But the key issue at the moment is what do you do with the, my bugbear, the fact that 60% of South Africa's economy is generated by Joburg and I included Koreleni, Tswane, because it's, it's one thing really, just the boundaries and obviously Durban and Cape Town. But that basically means the rest of the country almost getting like what you said, subpar politicians and lack of vision. So I could see where that model could come from, not so much for the metros, but for actually where we actually need a lot more economic growth. Because my back, Ben, I, that was going to be the question I was going to ask, because I know you've done a lot of work in the Northern Cape. The issue of you come back home and you see these many, many municipalities, as I said, ignoring the metros and what they represent, but the majority of people we forget still live in rural municipalities. Just making sense of that from just your understanding of local government. Mm, mm. Yeah, coming back home, I had to come back to that reality where I was still reminded that South Africa is still an African country. <laughs> you know, as much as we maybe consider ourselves of having metropolitan municipalities, which are, are you know, are advancing or idealistically want to you know, position themselves as, you know, um, modern cities in Africa. But the mere fact is that we still have larger populations living in the in the periphery, in the margins of the state. And I think, um, TK, that's why I, I tended to have a sense of biasness when it comes to my research and my work by, by actually looking at um, municipalities that I, that I term as municipalities in the margins of the state, um, municipalities that are in the periphery, that are in the rural areas. Um, the Northern Cape is, has a different type of typology when you have to classify it as a rural area because you cannot really compare it to rural areas in Limpopo, in the Eastern Cape, in the way in which it is geographically positioned. Um, you look at its environment, I mean, barren land, sand, sparsely populated communities, communities that have a long history, you know, hot, with a very minority hot. community, exactly, which is the Khoi and the San, which have been, so, you know, substantially marginalized in this country. Very little development positioned as a point of extraction when you look at the mines that are, that are found in the province. And these are municipalities that struggle, you know, to even collect revenue because they've got densely, uh, sorry, um, a high number of, popul of, of population, um, you know, dominating within the margins of actually being unemployed, being farm workers, a bad history, you know, of alcohol abuse, alcoholic fetal syndrome, you know, it's, 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 it's really, it's really sad. And yet, this is a province that even during COVID continued to contribute towards the GDP of our economy quite significantly, because mining activities continue to, you know, to operate in the Northern Cape. So then I, I, I really do have the sense of biasness in the sense that through my work, I try to remind us of this euphoria or euphoria that, you know, we are not as urbanized as we think we are. We still need to think about the characteristic of rurality and poverty that we face, which has an impact, you know, on our local state, a state that is expected to drive development, a state that is expected to be self-sustainable, a state that is expected to deliver services, etc. So through my work, that became a, a very important um, trajectory that I started to look at and also looking at it from an intergovernmental relations uh, perspective, because from the recent publication that I did um, on the renewable energy sector, the independent power producers, which started in the Northern Cape, and 10 years later, I wanted to see what kind of development these IPPs brought into the Northern Cape. It was quite sad to find that, you know, a municipality such as Mtanjeni can actually tell you that today they are sitting with an ESCOM debt, local communities who are unemployed, local communities who still do not have access to the proceeds via the the community trust that was set up by those IPPs, communities that their skills have not 
tremendously, you know, advanced because you would expect that there would be some sort of skills training, you know, and and ensuring that, you know, in the next round of IPPs, there would be community members who are educated and skilled enough, you know, to work within these IPPs when they when they have to develop. So, you know, it's 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 like, you know, it's like a, a history repeating itself. So my question mm -hmm. is the diamond mines that have been there they've left a similar type, type of, of, of threat. The IPPs that we are advancing to towards renewable energy in order to address climate change and the energy crisis we are having in this country, we are still seeing a similar type of threat. So, you know, it, 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 it becomes quite, quite, quite a paradox if you look at that, if whether these municipalities will ever be self-sufficient enough to carry themselves moving forward as their economies are starting to shift towards a modern form of economy that we are seeing in the in the climate change sector. And, and I think that's a particularly fascinating. It's almost as though one, I think in, I remember from my Greek uh, philosophies, it was Genesis, you know, the, the, the God in its small letter G, who had the ability to look past and future. Because I think you're just touching on another thing. Yes, you touched on high municipalities. You were there to see that what's happening in the UK. It plays itself out here. And then I think you've touched on something quite critical, which I think government is not really thinking about this issue of having this, uh, what they call it, just energy transition or just transition. And like you said, so it should be, if I always say this, if our state was a learning state, what they should be thinking about is we have this experience in the Northern Cape, as you've, I think, quite perfectly captured it. And you see what the results are, because this will eventually come to the city of Joburg and other areas. So why is it that... Uh, because another, I know, having lived uh, when I lived in Australia, those places that are not termed states are territories. They're almost in a site of where you can actually experiment to say, okay, this is what we want to do. We can't do it in places where North New South Wales, where Sydney is, but we can do it maybe in the Northern Territory. How is it that our state is not learning? Because I would think, if you have a functioning government, one of the things you learn from local government is it's a site of experiment, so that you can actually do a broader national vision. Because it worries me when you say that IPPs, again, lessons are not being learned because it's almost presented as, oh, this is going to solve everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, just as an example, I, I had the opportunity of, of presenting my work um, to the Northern Cape um, government leadership um, through the Premier's office, the office of the Premier. And there were MECs and members of the, the legislature who also got to read my work. Um, local government also got to read my work in the Northern Cape. Salga was taken aback. And some of the members of Salga were actually saying that, yeah, this is what happens when local government is treated as a stepchild, you know, or an, as an afterthought in the process of development. But what was quite fascinating is that Although they were supposed to look at it as a lessons learned and use that report to better inform them um, when it comes to the next development that they are preparing for, which is the green hydrogen um, development in, in, in Ruchtesfeld, the Namakwa um, district on the coast of of the Northern Cape. Mind you, a lot of people even forget that the Northern Cape has a sea, has a coastal line. <laughs> I, I wait on that. I will not lie. I actually... I actually went to the Northern Cape for the first time this year. And mm. and when they say, because, you know, as I, said, I was born in Gauteng, so when you think South Africa, you either think yeah. east-west, and then yes. you're like, oh, yeah, it's actually the largest province with an actual coastline. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm guilty. The Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and during COVID, it was the only beach area that was not closed during that time. <laughs> and, and actually quite... It's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> when I went, I was shocked at how beautiful the Northern Cape actually is. Oh, yes. But sorry, I just stayed you there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I mean, I, I I really had expectations that they would use that report to better plan, mm -hmm. to better position themselves, um, to help those municipalities who will be hosting um, this green hydrogen because it's coming with a huge investment. So yeah, I, I looked at their SEZ, you know, plans, and now they are also renewable energy, um, Z plans, you know, a very fascinating documentation. You know, South Africa is very good at developing, you know, developmental <laughs> documents. Very good, you know. 
the renewable energy um, belt is very interesting in all its dynamics. But, you know, my, my worry is that nobody is talking about the state of readiness of a municipality to host this big development that is coming with quite a lot of money that is being invested by the Germans and the US. For example, to make it simple, TK, local government is very simple. If a president has issued, you know, a mandate of saying that, okay, this is where we are planning to have the green hydrogen. It's gonna contribute so much towards our economy. It's going to address these issues when it comes to even our own domestic consumption. Now, if we are going to be having a small municipality that is grant dependent, that cannot generate revenue, the expectation is that during the period of the development of this kind of um, infrastructure, that municipality will actually have to carry a huge burden in terms of the economic migration, population growth, the infrastructure, the bulk service infrastructure that is not within capacity to host a growing population. I mean, no. we're talking about water, sanitation, sewer systems. We're talking about housing. Namakwa gets only allocated 50 houses from the Department of, of Human Settlements, the roads, no proper town planning. There's a bypass that will have to be re-evaluated that goes in, into the town via Port Nollet be, before it can actually get um, to the area which is called Boho Bay. It's between Port Nollet and, Wal and not Walvis Bay, now I'm thinking about Namibia, <laughs> Alexandra <laughs> Bay. Yeah, <laughs> of which Walvis Bay is also positioning itself to also become a player in this field. But anyway, so... You know, if you're going to have a bypass that goes into that, to that town, there will be numerous trucks carrying heavy industrial material. Mm. Now, is that municipality not supposed to say that our road infrastructure is going to take a toll? We need to reach out to the Department of Transport. We need to reach out to the Department of Public Works so that we can actually see if whether there cannot be a road that will be built, you know, that don't have to go inside the, uh, sorry, inside the, the municipality, the the town itself, but it will be a bypass on the edges of the town in order to carry that that um, that traffic. No one is talking about that, TK, except mm. everybody's still excited about this new economy that is about to boom, job creation, you know, expectations. And that's when I learned that, you know what, our government is really not yet prepared to take these things seriously because they have far greater implications for local municipalities who are already struggling. So that's that's another case in point that I can actually demonstrate to you the extent to which really our intergovernmental um, relations is not being taken serious in this country when it comes to planning. And I think actually echoing, I'm actually at a, at a, it's called a winter school by the National School of Government. And we just had uh, Dr. Padi Lewotler speak. And he's actually echoed what you're saying, that this is a state which is poor at planning. And I, and look, I uh, just, my, my background with local government is I started working at the City Bank District Municipality. And coming from the Valley, we could early see what the science of what happens when you ignore local government. I mean, it used to be one of the most beautiful secondary cities because that's another concept in South Africa. We've forgotten because, like you're saying, everybody rushes to Joburg and people forget that the strain it's taking. But if you're smart, you have a secondary city which allows for other development. But again, we've just seen it totally being dilapidated. And maybe it, it touches on something which you, you've asked, which is how is it that local government being so important is in the mind, and I'm not saying it in the mind of politicians, which I know you have a history of, because uh, I think every political person that commentates, apparently that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be soothsayers to see what's in their mind. But just from your interaction with politicians, why is it that they don't see the value of local government? Mm. Interestingly, yes, I do have a background of working for a political party, and it was due to my very inquisitive nature of actually wanting to understand how political parties think when it comes to policy development. So mm. I landed up being that experimentalist. Um, it was so they think, we can agree that they do think. 
I'll, I'll, you don't have to answer that. I'll, 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 if I put it out there, people, you can you can direct that to me. It's fine. If I have to, st if I have to, st to use a statistical, you know, hypothesis, you know, to to demonstrate this, <laughs> I could actually say most probably thirty percent do apply their minds. <laughs> okay, no, but, continue. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, the most fascinating thing is um, coming back to this like, little hypothesis that I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that. If if you if you do not have um, an administrative and think tank, I'll just use the word think tank um, just loosely to support politicians and political leaders and political parties, then that's why you find that when it comes to the way in which they understand lateral thinking, they understand integrated thinking, it becomes very difficult for them. Because, you know, political parties have, you know, one focus, one focus only is to stay in power, win elections, galvanize, you know, within the African context, even use state resources to galvanize support and legitimacy. You know, that's the one thing in mind. But then when now it comes to substantial understanding of the way in which the state is integrated and the way in which the state, the state is supposed to work together, you know, to plan execute, monitor, evaluate, provide oversight, that becomes very fragmented and fractured. And, uh, and hence, that's why I think that local government becomes an afterthought because the way mm. in which politics are shaped in this country, especially from a political perspective, they are seen you know, to be shaped from a high level perspective where if, for example, the ANC can get the legitimacy of a president, um, and national elections where the ANC can get a legitimacy um, through the premier and the executive um, via provincial elections, then local government ordinarily becomes an afterthought in the sense that, you no, know, now we're just looking at this tier that's at a local level. It's no longer it's a sphere, it's a tier at local government mm. level where, you know, it doesn't really contribute towards, you know, the legitimacy of the state, you know, that is governed by a ruling party. So I'm just reflecting it in that position from a political um, um, political party and political leadership uh, perspective. And, uh, you know, because I'm free to talk about uh, my experiences, I, I'm not going to hold back. You know, <laughs> I was I was I was heading, you know, the the, the policy, the policy um the policy division of the ANC. So the, pol the policy division of the ANC has got subcommittees and these subcommittees, they sit on a quarterly basis. They do the reviews and the implementation of the ANC manifesto, their policy um, you know, resolutions. Um, if, if there are certain resolutions that need further interrogation research, you know, we'd be there to provide that kind of support. But interestingly, out of all those policy subcommittees, there was a subcommittee called Legislature and Governance, which actually, you know, provides political oversight and overview for local government. Now, that was one policy subcommittee that I can actually tell you that it was the best out of all the subcommittees compared to education, social, economic development, etc because it had a political leader. And I will say this, I will, I will really gladly say this. It had a political leader who was appointed as the chairperson, who was a lawyer by profession, um, who understood local government very well, um, a person who was very committed to his work, who was also part of the legislature and he understood the problems that we're having in local government. Now, it was a pleasure to work with him because he prioritized local government more than anything else. Now, if you have to compare this with other ANC structures, you know, um, in the various provinces, when you have to look at these subcommittees, you'll still find that local government remains an afterthought. And most probably that's why our, our current minister of cooperative government has been struggling to really get the voice through in terms of prioritizing local government looking at the state from below, not from the top, mm -hmm. but from below, because the state from below can actually give you a mirror image of what the state is from the top, 
you see. So, I mean, that, that for me, from a political perspective, it comes from that understanding that it goes wrong within the political structures where they're supposed to provide the kind of leadership, attention, you know, and understanding in terms of the importance of local government and why the voice of local government needs to be to be advanced more than any other sphere because it talks to the whole different um, type of developmental priorities a country should be looking at. So that's an example that I mm. thought I should give you from a political perspective. It's actually yeah. quite interesting because it actually kind of takes me to, I, I was wondering how to put it in that, now that one might say the counterfactual to this is if you look at the Democratic Alliance, Helen Ziller, city of Cape Town. And if you look at where the, uh, look, I think you can ignore the current guy, but where they're slated to go is going to be possibly another mayor of Cape Town, which is Jordan Lewis Hill, right? I think that's how you say his name. And then, or, or I think the famous one is Papas. So would that maybe explain why? The, I guess we can say, does the Democratic Alliance take local government more seriously? Or, or yeah, because in everything we've discussed, you know, we'd be amiss not to discuss uh, yeah. what they term as the exceptional state, or some might say the immaculate <laughs> state, named the Western Cape, where, look, mm. I, I have some reservations, if you look at pure numbers, about, and they, you have to also understand the history of the Western Cape in terms of municipalities mm. to, to get why that, they've always had a bit of an advantage, but you can't take away from the fact that when you walk into the CBD, well, you can walk around the CBD of Cape Town, as opposed to walking around the CBD of either Frenachem or even Joburg. So just if you could maybe touch on that a bit like this, the immaculate mm -hmm. state of uh, named the Western province and also the idea that it in 33 decades, you should be seeing more mayors become president of a country. Of course, of course absolutely. I mean, um, you know, for the DA, understanding that, you know, it is an opposition party and they have found it very difficult, you know, to gain a political leverage in different provinces in terms of governing those provinces with the Western Cape as an, as an exceptionalism. And now they, they were trying to actually move towards the Gauteng um, province. But I think they, they, their strategy was to say that, okay, if we can't um, have provinces, let us rather focus, you know, on the micro level, which is local government, where we as the DA, we have a better political leverage in terms of demonstrating our governance capabilities. And that's where we should try to focus even our human resources, our political, administrative, human resources, and also focus on the idea of building, you know, a cohesive DA at that macro level. And I think that it has worked for them. And, and, and one of the things that I do have to, to, to give it to the DA is, is their very interesting approach in the way in which they, they select their candidates. I mean, the DA, of course, being a liberal party, it has actually, you know, taken, you know, the, the approach of saying that if you want to become a councillor, you have to apply to become a councillor. You have mm -hmm. to submit a CV to be a councillor. You have to show that you do have community backing and demonstrate the work that you have been you have been doing in your community as a professional with skills and knowledge who is, you know, entrenched in their community. And I guess that system of filtering the kind of candidates that we, we see today coming out as candidates who are, you know, very efficient in their work, who are very committed in their work, who have no qualms about political mobility, but, you know, very, you know, committed in doing work at local government, most probably actually gives us a different kind of approach and understanding of how the DA operates. But the DA, on the other hand, has been grooming, you know, the kind of leaders that we are seeing emerging in local government. Even the mayor of Cape Town has been with with, with local government for many years, uh, sorry, um, in the DA for many years, since, you know, his, his early, early stages of adulthood, you know, growing up in the structures of of the DA up to the state, you know, the stage where he is today. So that is one fascinating um, perspective that I've seen from the DA and also taking into account that the focus is rather at a micro level, getting things done at a micro level in order to, you know, to, get, to, to sort of like demonstrate the kind of public confidence that they will need to gain um, in order for, for citizens to, you know, to give them that approach. So yeah. Um, and also just touching on the issue of, 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 of mayors not being able to ascend at, at presidential level, 
the other day I was having a conversation with the with the Salga chairperson, um, um, Councillor Stofile, and he was saying that it's quite interesting that cities in um, in the in the global north, especially in Europe, um, mayors are actually paid quite handsomely than the mm. prime ministers and the presidents because mm. those cities they take local government serious because they see local government as a point of entry when it comes to social economic development and investments so there's there, there, there is an incentivized and and not just only incentivized by but also saying that we look for highly capable individuals who will be able to, to position cities as the pathway or entryway into the city. And I guess um, that, that also affirms what I've been trying to say about understanding the state from below rather than looking at the state from above. If you build the state from below, then, you know, at national government level, it becomes easier to identify, you know, the socioeconomic priorities and directions that a country should be getting because of that support. No, no, that's quite interesting. I'd also be remiss to forget Mr. Bongani Beloy. I think he started something else. But again, it's a factory that, like you said, taking away, look, you might not win this, the, the site of struggle of national and provincial, but in making local government where it's at, uh, things tend to, to happen very easy. And if I'm not mistaken, I mean, look, I know he didn't quite make it that high. But if you look at what's happening with a lot of, uh, I think it's uh, the Florida governor, which I think that you can almost say that is a, their form of local government, but in a provincial sense, and not forgetting um, former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani. Mm. So it, I always remember people saying, if you can manage the complexities of local government, the national, it, it becomes a bit easier. Because again, yeah. you actually, and I, not obviously China's model as well, that you need to show at every stage of government that you excel, but you need to start at the local. But yeah, like, yeah so, so you're actually quite right in saying that. So yeah, so I think moving towards a, almost a closure, and I think you've, you've given us an interesting, the UK model, of, and I think you've also always given us something to think about. So where do we then go with local government in the next, uh, what, I think uh, the next elections, is it 2026 or 2025, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, after the, oh. na na after the national elections. And maybe that's another thing. Do we really need to always have it five or do you actually need seven years of proper being a mayor to actually embed yourself? So just, yeah, just maybe on those things. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we don't want to canonize individuals <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until no, they no, get no, no. in a comfort seat and comfort zone. But uh, yeah, just, just to address the first question. I, I find it very difficult to, to, to make um, predictions about the future of local government, particularly in South Africa, because we are a young democracy that is trying to mature before its age. I can tell mm -hmm. you that. Um, and we are. We are maturing before our age. And maybe those are the implications of wanting to become, you know, a a democracy that is used, you know, as a case example for countries, you know, globally. But um, I also regard local government as, as, a, as a moving molecular, you know, it, it, it's, it's always moving. Um, it's, it's, it's not stagnant, it reshapes itself um, with time, although you might try to predict, but predictions cannot be, you know, concluded holistically because you have to think about local dynamics that are happening in different regions, but you may get a sense of where we are moving. And one thing that I can say is that the, the, the urgency, the urgency of attending, you know, to the legislative reforms, number one, mm -hmm. is very important. The MSA, Municipal Structures Act, the Systems Act, um, there needs to be greater attention paid there because those pieces of legislations were built on assumptions that there will always be a, a dominant party kind of system, you know, that will exist at local government level. Now we are seeing a different change and some of the, the, the sections and, you know, the subsections in this legislation are not helping, you know, to remedy the situation that we are facing. So those legislative reforms are very important. Um, secondly, the the fiscal framework, yeah. Um, yeah. it's it's really not going to take us anywhere, particularly for these form for, um, um, these um, rural municipalities who we, we consider to be in the periphery of the state, which absolutely do not have, you know, any capabilities of raising their own revenue um, while we are faced with a 
fiscal deficit in this country, you know, it's so unpredictable in terms of what, what, what state we will be in the next couple of years with all these loans that we are taking from the fret and words of this world, you know, and dictating exactly how we should structure our governance systems, coming with austerity measures that might really have a dent on our fiscal framework. Or so, oh, to intervene, uh, the one now where you take a loan for a just transition, where you, you stop coal in the hope of, basically you, be, you become a franchise, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. not even a franchise owner, you, you're just a site of being a franchise, but you've got coal right there. We, yeah. we love yeah. the environment, <laughs> we have to protect it. But yeah, so you're right, these loans are problematic often by it's themselves. Very problematic, true TK, very problematic. So it, it, brings, it brings uncertainties, it brings uncertainties because these are the path dependencies that we just cannot mm-hmm. divorce ourselves from, you know, as South Africa, you know, as, as an African country in Africa, it, it's very difficult for us to do that. So they have a larger, greater implication on local government when it comes to the self-sustainability or the financial sustainability of local government in the future, where there's no guarantee that if you drive in, in Queenstown today, 10 years later, when you get to Queenstown, you might find that um, the main street has just been turned into gravel road because there's absolutely no yeah. money you know, to rebuild and, in, and maintain that infrastructure. So the fiscal framework needs to be taken very seriously. These reforms, they need to just happen. The reviewing of the white paper, I've been saying that time and time and again, TKU, you and I, we come from a policy background. We know that, you know, when you set out a policy paper, it becomes a statement of intent. You know, it's not a legislation, Mm -hmm. you know, that cannot be changed. Um, Even legislation can be reviewed, but white papers can be reviewed. And I don't know why we are taking so long to actually take the decision in this country of saying that now it's time to call for the review of the white paper because the kind of assumption assumptions that were made are not yielding the results that we wanted to see. And maybe we should actually step back and say, okay, let's look at a green paper that will try, you know, to disentangle these complexities that we are faced Mm. with and try to build a white paper that will be practical in talking to the kind of circumstances that we are facing 33 years later. Politically, the political system needs to change um, in the sense that when it comes to political um, understanding of what it means to be a representative um, at local government level, what is representational democracy or representative or local representative democracy, and what are the capabilities that are needed to foster the kind of leadership at local government we need um, as citizens to ensure that our voices are heard. We have leaders who are able to work with their communities, leaders who are not antagonistic um, of polarizing voices that are emerging in their communities, you know, leaders who are agile leaders who are able to even go out in the public and let us see them being responsive, you know, and interacting with the public. It's a pity that um, the Prime Minister of, of New Zealand had to step down, but I used to follow her quite often and I found her so fascinating because she was the kind of Prime Minister who never waited for a formal statement to be released. She would mm. get onto Facebook be- after having a a meeting with a committee or, you know, uh, her executive and brief the public on the kind of decisions that they've made, you know, answer questions, you know, just to show that you are able to engage, you're not hiding behind the high walls or, you know, or or the city council chambers where after a mayoral committee meeting, we hardly get any briefings from our councillors, even on social media. That kind of interaction is very important to espouse the kind of modern leader that we we want to see, we want to elect. So the kind of political, you know, um, strategies that we need to take forward, we need to reconsider our traditional methods and try to move on with the, with the, you know, with the wheels, the kind of molecules that I was saying that are shifting all the time. And um, lastly, I've, I will not stress this in any <laughs> capacity in the administration. I, I, I'm feeling so, so, you know, daunted and tired and fatigued about talking about capacity, capacity, because we started talking about this many moons ago. 
and we are still not getting it right. We have to, we have to address that issue. They, we, 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 I mean, we cannot, we cannot ignore the fact that there is a huge outcry coming from the public where people are saying that enough of political appointments, um, it's time for us to look at a merit-based system. And I'm not just trying to, you know, to evoke a debate about um, whether political appointments are the right thing to do or not at senior management level. But let's be factual about the practices that are happening in municipalities. Political mm. appointments go down to the level of a cleaner. Mm, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, there we talk, we're supposed to be looking at skills, the ability, mm. the ability for people to execute their work, whether they're at middle uh, management, you know, uh, lower management, um, up to, you know, your workers, your municipal workers, we need to start thinking about the way in which we try to create a much more professional environment, an environment that that will, you know, that will foster the kind of professionals that we need for local government outside of the party political parameters that tend to overwhelm or trumpet the kind of administrative professionalism that we need at local government. So yeah, if we can address these issues in the future, maybe there is hope that we can salvage the situation. But if we cannot address these issues, then yeah, we, we might be heading towards a, a down spiral, especially now that we are looking at another complexity of coalition politics that's really going to to take us into a different um, kind of democracy that we want to see. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the Prime Minister, uh, just, is it uh, J Jacinda Ardell? I think I always forget her name, mm. the former Prime Minister of, of New Zealand. And, and I think you, you touched on uh, a few key things as we, as we are closing. And one of them is, you know, the political appointments to the level of cleanness. We're not, we're not even touching on the violence in many municipalities, which is, doesn't even get reported on because they're not part of the big. Uh, six or metros or big seven metros. So, and I, and I love the way you characterize this talk, which is to say the subnational or local government is a picture of what the future is going to hold. And so I, I guess maybe just to close off, I'd say you've been made uh, the minister of Cocta. You've been given <laughs> special powers by our president. <laughs> Three things which you said, listen, we, we implement this. We are at least on the road to some form of taking local government seriously. Mm. Three wishes. I, I, I do not want to imagine myself as a minister. <laughs> okay, but imagine yourself being driven. <laughs> we all like the driving part. That's the only part that looks nice, is being driven. Now I see, I don't know if it's a, a colleague of mine was raising it, that especially for female ministers, their bags, they even have a bag carry. And I'm like, so this whole human being is being paid a salary. And it's normally officials for some reason. We have to mm. hold the handbag. But I digress. Yes, your three wishes. Mm. You know, my three wishes, um, if, if, if I were to be appointed a minister, the first thing that I would do is to actually, number one, set up a committee. Um, I know that South Africa has been, you know, critiqued for loving to set up committees um, in committees, um, even in, uh, commissions of inquiries, etc., but sometimes you need to set up a committee, a committee that has experts who will actually work on the reviews of the legislation so that yep. when a proposal is brought into parliament, because you have to bring that proposal to parliament to be reviewed because you're proposing a bill, you have a solid, a solid review that has been backed by empirical evidence that has been looked at from many different angles um, in order to accommodate you know, the whole idea of decentralization in, in South Africa from a local government perspective. That's the first thing that we need to deal with. Um, we, we cannot move. I mean, the mere fact that tomorrow, you know, there would be another motion of no confidence. A speaker might decide not to take petitions um, because they, they, they have their own reasons of doing that, having to litigate, having the municipal manager being challenged if, if the municipal manager has to call in councils, you know, these things are embedded in legislation that does not talk mm. to the reality that we are faced yeah. with. Yeah, so that is, is of empirical importance to me. And then secondly, um, I know that we are talking about the district development model um, that is being used for coordination, et cetera, but I don't think that, you know, it's, 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 it's the kind of medicine that will resolve all our issues. 
as the minister, what I would actually say is try to convince my political party to say that, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, we are faced with the threat of losing power. And if we lose power, um, trying to hang on to our egos and trying to hang on to our historical inertia of wanting to be a dominant party, we run at a risk of taking the state down with us. So we need to change the conduct of our politics. It's about time that we recognize the fact that we need to push ahead with the professionalization bill, whether we like it or not. That has been outstanding. It has been sitting for far too long. Um, we're trying to appease our unions. Of course, some of their concerns are legit, but some concerns, we understand that they tend to be political in nature. Um, yeah, I, I'll talk about that at some other point in time when you and I have a discussion. So yeah, I would set, make that my second priority. My third priority is to make sure that you know, the coordination comes from below and not from the top. I would mm. actually want to get a, an influential seat, you know, um, in the presidential um, um, infrastructure coordinating committee, where I would be given priority when the president says that there are certain things that we are planning to do. And I would be given priority to have a conversation with the president to say, okay, president, there are these things that you are, you are, you know, you are advancing towards to these investments. But now let's talk about local government before mm. you sign the dotted agreement. Let's talk about local government. Let's talk about Steve Chwet, a district municipality in Bumalanga that is facing threats of the just transition, you know, program. Let's talk about mm. um, municipalities in the coastal uh, region of the Eastern Cape that have communities who are pushing against, you know, the gas, um, um, the gas development that ought to happen there. Let's also talk about, you know, the, the municipalities in the borders of Zimbabwe, which are faced with day-to-day -day problems and issues in the borderlines because they serve as, you know, the margins where, you know, the state borders exist. You know, these issues, I, I would actually want to make the president understand that you cannot think that you are the head of state if you do not actually have the local state under, you know, your kind of guidance that you need before you can actually sign any dotted lines for any developmental programs. So I think that's the kind of influential position I'll try to lobby for. <laughs> Um, no, no, I think I, I, I promote you not from a minister, but because it, it's always been something I think which you've touched on, which is the idea that maybe what we need is a president for foreign policy, because our president seems to love going overseas, and a prime minister, basically a minister of home affairs, uh, who actually looks at everything, like you said, the subnational, because really without that, we're not moving anywhere. But Doc, yeah. thank you so, so much. Uh, yeah, hopefully, I know you've opened my eyes what comes from local government because yeah, I think this is why I believe local government is probably the most exciting and, and I say when I see it transform South Africa is when I see local government taking its rightful place so until we see that as I think you've really impressed upon many of us we really are just basically looking at it backwards so from the UK from UKZN to the UK to Birmingham to the Northern Cape to certain offices within the ANC what <laughs> I always have this section where I ask, what can we look forward to from you in the coming months? If we have to keep an eye on you, mm. what mm. what's next for you? What's coming? Mm. Oh, in, the coming... Prime Minister. <laughs> in the coming months, um, I'm looking forward to um, publishing my second um, report, which looks at the current state of the green hydrogen development in the Northern Cape so that I can contribute towards now providing a holistic understanding in the way in which our state plans and the lessons that we do not learn and the kind of implications that we, will we are going to most probably see um, developing in those kinds of municipalities, the, the, the small rural municipalities. So be on the lookout uh, for that publication. And um, secondly, I'll be now focusing more um, on political governance. Um, this is something that we'll have a conversation with after this, this podcast, you and I. I'm, I'm actually interested now in stepping back into the space of understanding, you know, the kind of phenomena that we are seeing in our local representative democracy. Because one thing that we lack in South Africa from an academic perspective is theorizing the local state 
from the local government perspective when we look at democracy and representational democracy holistically. So I want to step into that space and also talking um, in relation to the kind of governance system that we want to see. So um, be on the lookout with more work that I'll be writing on based on empirical work that looks at you know, the rise of independent candidates, the rise of social movements um, in relation to the way in which they, they advance local democracy and accountability and governance. And um, this work will now be you know, being located within the coalition formation um, that we are seeing at local government. So yeah, um, those are the two pieces of focus that I will be focusing on. So yeah, moving forward, let's let's uh, let's see what comes out of it. Yeah. Well, Dr. Tina and Zo, the one we call the oracle who has seen and foresees what is happening, especially <laughs> from the perspective of local government. Thank you so much for your time. And we are looking forward to more engagements because I think you really have, uh, yeah, I think you've teased out something very important and almost, I will also say not so much problematized, but you've also given us possible solutions for where we can actually take the, the state of the Republic. So thank you so much and uh, all the best uh, and all God's best with the, your future endeavors. All right. Thank you so much, TK. I, I really enjoyed having this conversation with you guys and also all the best moving forward with your podcasts. And that is our episode of the TK Show, where we've just had Dr. Tina and Zoe really giving an insight into local government. And I think most importantly, almost giving us a, a map and a blueprint of how we can actually get to South Africa's recovery. Because I think, as she says, you cannot understand the republic without understanding it from below and below shapes what happens in the future. So thank you, and we look forward to the next TK show, where we're hoping to have a book review by a certain Mr. Justice Malala. So we'll just leave it right there, and thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and rate us on all your preferred podcast platforms. If you'd like to find out more about what we're doing, please join our Substack community via the link in the comments below. And as always, we'd love to hear your suggestions for future guests and conversation topics.